Welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Join us on the Banking Transform podcast is Alex Tapscott, co-founder of the Blockchain Research Institute and author of the highly anticipated book, Web3, charting the internet's next economic and cultural frontier. In this interview, we explore the world of Web3 and discuss how Web3 differs from today's internet. What components are real versus hype, where the technology may be headed next, and its potential impacts on banking, financial services, and our lives. Alex also discusses high-impact potential Web3 use cases for banks like reinvented payments, lending, investments, and shares how banks can navigate the challenges and seize the opportunities presented by Web3 Revolution. While parts of Web3 remain aspirational, there are already real-world examples of deployment of Web3 technologies. It's time to dispel some of the hype, expand our understanding of what is possible, and propel for a compelling vision of how Web3.0 could transform banking and finance, as well as every part of our daily lives. So Alex, before we dig into what's happening with Internet's next frontier, can you share a bit about your background as well as what prompted you to write your latest book? Certainly. So I began my career working in traditional finance, what my Web3 would, friends would call TradFi. And I was actually an investment banker for, for about seven or eight years, um, really all through my early, early and mid to late 20s. And it was while I was on the job there that I first learned about this thing called Bitcoin. Now, this was before the word blockchain had entered the vernacular, and certainly before the term Web3 had, had even been coined. But I um, you know, was curious about this new asset. And I think like a lot of people, a little skeptical. But the more I looked into it, the more convinced I became that not only was Bitcoin itself a really important innovation, the underlying blockchain technology could be foundational to a next era of maybe finance and, and certainly technology. And uh, I just started to, you know, dig in. I, I, I was spending time on, on weekends and evenings uh, researching and investigating this further. And all of that research and investigation led to a couple of big reports that I put together just in my spare time while I was still full time on the job. And those reports led to further research that I actually ended up doing with my dad, Don Tapscott, and together that research became the basis for a book that we put out called Blockchain Revolution. That book was released in 2016. And uh, they say luck is the combination of preparation and good timing. Well, our timing was terrific on that book. This was right around the time that people in, in finance and, and in other parts of the economy were curious about this technology and didn't have a way to understand it. And it went on to you know sell 19, uh, so, sorry, sell half a million copies and was translated into 19 languages. Um, so over the last five years or so, I've been deeply involved in this industry in several ways. I've been an investor, an advisor. I've invested other people's capital as well. I ran a venture capital fund that raised 20 million and deployed it into the market, eventually returning about 50 million to investors. And today I actually work as a portfolio manager running a ETF that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange, investing into Web3 use cases uh, through public equities, digital assets, and, and other investment opportunities. And so, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, in doing all of this, I sort of saw that um, that more and more was happening in this industry. And just as in 2015-16, I felt like there was a real need for a new book to be released into the market that could help to ex explain to people, you know, what is Web3? Why is it important? Why should you care? And what does this mean for, for business society in the world? And that was the impetus for the book. And I'm uh, very pleased to say that it's out now and just hit the Wall Street Journal bestseller list as a business book at number five. So clearly the topic uh, timing was right on this, hopefully, and it's resonating with a broad audience. Well, I did get the book, as I told you I would, and uh, got into it a bit. It, it's interesting because, you know, we met each other in person about five years ago when blockchain yeah. was at the, the tipping point. We met each other at a, an event we were both speaking at in Dubai. And, you know, a lot's happened, as you said, since then. It's, it's actually yeah. an expansion of the theme of what's possible with technology and data and everything else in the world today. Can you provide a simple definition from your perspective of what Web 3.0 is for our audience and explain how it differs from the internet as we know it today? Certainly. So I think just to understand Web 3, it's important to understand 
what came before. So Web 1, what I think a lot of people remember as the dot-com era, was basically a static medium for the presentation of information on websites. So, you know, you'd go online and you'd, you know, log on and you'd look at a website. You could read information and you could look at media and so forth. But in general, it was very limited. It wasn't interactive. You couldn't upload your own content. The, the web was basically a, a broadcast medium, not a, not a collaborative yep. medium. Um, in, in the early to mid 2000s, some technology innovations um, occurred that made the web more of a tool for communication and collaboration. So um, social apps and user generated content became sort of the dominant and defining applications and businesses of that period of time. And uh, web two, you know, as a collaborative medium, had a lot of benefits. For one, it created tons of value for several big companies. If you're a shareholder of you know, Google or Amazon, you did very, very well. It also onboarded billions of people um, onto the internet mm-hmm. that previously didn't have access. And it gave voice to people who maybe didn't have a way to um, speak their mind in the past, You know, a platform for individuals to publish information. And that was all very good, well and good, but it came with some pretty, um, you know, big drawbacks. And some of those drawbacks we're still living with today. You know, the web as a, um, basically all the value was captured by these big platforms. The, those platforms relied on advertising, which kept people, you know, hooked on recommendation engines. We saw monopolies form in certain areas, like say search or operating systems and other parts of the economy. And as a result, that actually stifled development and innovation in the, in the private sector. So there's all these things that in a way kind of prevented the web from reaching its full potential that we saw in web two. So if web one was the, um, you know, web for brought for consuming content, web two is a tool for collaboration, then web three is what we call the ownership web. So it is a way for individuals to own the asset class of the digital age. That means owning their own um, identity, their own data, their own digital creations, their own assets, um, and being able to, you know, uh, possess those in a, in the tr- in a true sense of the world, word, to have digital property rights. Um, and that's something that we've never really had before. Before all of the value that was created through user-generated content and collaboration online um, was captured asymmetrically by a handful of big platforms and, and intermediaries. And with Web3, the simple promise is that internet users can become internet owners. And I think as with other areas of the web, it's going to be foundational to business. And, um, you know, and we can talk about finance in a second, but it's going to change financial services in a way that I think people um, haven't quite come to grips with yet. So what do you see as the core components of Web3? Mm. You know, we talk about different items within that realm. Yeah. Some people put it within Web3. Some people put it with outside of Web3. And, and how do these different components actually work together to drive this new paradigm? Yeah, so... We're in this really interesting period right now where where several technologies are all emerging at once. Once in a while, you see a new technology burst onto the scene that transforms the economic power grid and the old order of human affairs, you know, the transistor, the internet itself, um, the television, the radio, and so forth. And now we're seeing all these new technologies. So the foundational technology of Web3 is blockchain. And that's the thing that got me started seven years ago, and it continues to be the basis for all of this. So blockchains, for people who don't understand, um, very simply put, are uh, a way for individuals and businesses to move and store value online peer-to-peer. And what they also do is automate complex business processes with software. So there's a thing called a smart contract that basically can take everything that a traditional business agreement might perform, you know, involving lawyers and investment bankers and other um, agents to enforce the terms and automates it into software. So, you know, within financial services, every stock, every bond, every futures contract is a contract. And so those contracts and all the terms that are in them, for example, can be automated using software, using blockchain. So that's one example. So blockchains are the foundational technology. The second technology that's emerging right now is artificial intelligence. AI is, I think, allowing us to reimagine what we thought computers could do, certainly, but also what people could do when when, um, aligned with these tools and using these tools. And that's going to create all sorts of new opportunities and productivity gains, I believe, but also lots of uh, problems as well. There's another technology, which is extended reality. Um, So for most of the web's existence, it's been pretty much two-dimensional, right? So the desktop 
fully two-dimensional. The smartphone, maybe 2.5D because you're interacting with your physical environment a little bit. You know, when you, when you, when you hail an Uber, it's sort of like not fully 2D, it's sort of 2.5-dimensional. But what extended reality, so that's virtual reality and augmented reality, promises to make the web three-dimensional or spatial. And that, that's a technology that's also uh, happening at the same time. And then the final technology is connected devices. So there are going to be trillions of devices with internet connections that are going to do everything from, you know, um, keeping us safe to monitoring our glucose to driving us around to, you know, you name it, right? So connected devices. And those connected devices are going to become increasingly sophisticated. So all of these technologies are not separate but related. In, in my view, in the same way that the term internet went from describing, you know, a narrow set of internetworking technologies to describing a whole new range of business models and social behaviors and other technologies, the same is true for Web3. We think of these technologies as discrete areas of innovation, but the reality is it's going to be the convergence of these technologies that's going to matter the most uh, for the future of business and for the future of financial services. You know, it's interesting, you know, over time and, and we're, we're all we all jump on bag, bandwagons quite quickly. And certainly before COVID, it was even quicker. There was a lot of money in the marketplace, a lot of money looking for places to store it. Yeah. So the hype cycle was really different for all these different technologies. And and to be honest, well, and we'll talk about it a little later, is that blockchain is is, is an accepted platform and something that the financial services industry is is currently using. AI yeah. is certainly um, at its beginning point, but certainly got a boost November 30th of last year with uh, with ChatGPT, and, yeah. and it just opened our eyes into just new realms of what can happen. But there's also things like NFTs, crypto that 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 have a hype cycle that has gone up, down, and everything else. Yeah. But there's a core of what Web 3.0 really is. What do you see today is pretty much a, it's a standardized pro platform. Oh, we also see that, you know, the three-dimensional aspect where we keep on looking at different goggle platforms and everything else, and it's a really limited marketplace. Yeah. What today do you consider foundational? And what are you really excited about in the near term yeah. as being truly something we're going to see as opposed to staying in the hype area for a little while? Definitely. Well, I think that to most people looking from the outside in, technology innovation seems like an overnight success story often. But but the reality is that it's, you know, decades in the making, sometimes centuries in the making in the case of, you know, computing itself. Um, you know, even AI in, in the 1960s, there were researchers right. in, in the UK saying in 20 years, AI will replace all human functionality in the economy. And, you know, in the 1980s, I'm pretty sure that hadn't happened. And so AI has had its uh, ups and downs, uh, extended reality, virtual reality. Similarly, we've seen plenty of kicks at the can and the technology just simply wasn't ready for prime time. And that's how it is with a lot of this stuff. It's the uh, the classic S curve where, you know, there's, there's a lot of time passing, but not that much innovation. And then all of a sudden there's an inflection point. And you correctly pointed out that I think AI had that moment, a chat, the chat GPT moment in November of last year. Um, but just because technology goes through cycles doesn't mean that, you know, in the down cycle, we should be dismissing it. If anything, those are the best times to, to be really investigating it and taking a close look. So anyway, to, to get to answer your question directly, um, you know, the thing that, that interests me most right now is that a lot of enterprise innovation and a lot of innovation at big banks has now moved from the proof of concept uh, stage where it's happening on internal systems to where they're building on public networks. And to me, that's very reminiscent of what happened in the 1990s, where a lot of big companies wanted to build on the, the, the web, on, on the internet, but didn't want to be on this you know, open platform where all the criminals and drug dealers and everybody was. And so they built closed proprietary networks called intranets. Right. And you know, with blockchain, similarly, Jim, like when we released Blockchain Revolution, 2016, 17 was the era of enterprise blockchain. But the problem is when you build something on a closed system, you're not um, it's it's inherently limiting because you're not open to the innovation of the open market. You're not able to connect with other people and, and businesses, and you end up kind of trapped in a silo. And so my point is that recently, and I'd say in the last kind of two years or so, 
what we've seen is big enterprises announcing or building on public networks. And part of the reason for that is that the networks themselves have become much more robust and more enterprise grade. You know, you could hardly blame, um, you know, a bank in 2016 right. wanting to build on a proprietary network. You look at the open market, the biggest public blockchain network, Ethereum, you know, was worth a couple of billion dollars and wasn't really ready for prime time, you know, as I've said before. Like, it just simply was not there yet. And now, the technology is. So today, for example, we we um, heard that uh, UBS uh, is building out a tokenized money market fund on Ethereum. And in the last five days, we've or sorry, five weeks or so, we've seen that announcement, Citibank saying it wants to tokenize all of its deposits, JP Morgan looking at launching an Ethereum-based um, coin and also looking to tokenize its um, um, uh, deposits as a as a uh, as a form of sort of like a stable money token tokenized stable money. Um, we saw Visa announcing that it's enabling merchant settlement on a public blockchain called Solana, and then PayPal, of course, launching its stablecoin PYUSD on the Ethereum network. So that's a lot of information I'm giving your listeners. But the point is that all of those initiatives, pretty much all those initiatives, are happening on public networks. And to me, that's the most exciting thing because the, the public networks are where all the innovation is occurring. And it's also where, by the way, all these different technologies are going to come together. Um, so to me, like, notwithstanding the fact that the market for, uh, you know, crypto or whatever is down a little bit right now, um, you can't let the tail wag the dog. You know, look at where look at where businesses are investing for the long run and where they're um, what they're most excited about. And it's all happening in this in this area. You know, it's interesting because you look at Web 3.0 and and even looking at the transformation of of technology going forward. I was just at Cybos, as I mentioned to you before yeah. our, our interview, and it was unique to see a couple things really coming in under the radar, but still very much top of mind. Number one, the movement from um, currency to value. So the expansion of the the mode of transfer going beyond just money to include trust, to include security, to include speed and scale, to include all these elements that really are well beyond a traditional currency form of transfer. Yeah. Secondly, that almost everything being done right now is really being done in a user-centric space, which, which in my mind means instead of doing it to reduce costs, it's being done to improve experiences and improving the, the our daily lives from a saving of time to saving of money and things of that nature. And thirdly, that the compart compartmentalization of, of everything that's going on and the composability of solutions and the partnering within specialties is broader than I've ever seen. I, I spent a lot of time at the IBM booth during the Cybos. Um, process, uh, Cybos uh, event. And it was very interesting how IBM, who used to be very much, it, it's pretty much IBM and nothing else, now is really reaching out to partners to say, how do we bring this to scale and speed in a way that's never been done before, reinventing how we come to market? How yeah. does Web3 really allow this all to happen and really move it at speed and scale? So that's a great question. And you pointed something out, which is I think when a new technology comes along, people want to look at how it's going to cut costs and improve efficiency. And we're even seeing this with AI. You know, it's like, oh, an AI bot can reduce your headcount at your call center or something like that. Um, and the reality is with new technologies, the market opportunity is uh, not only unknown at the time that it launches, but it's actually unknowable because the future is not something that we can easily predict, right? The future is bright, but it's not always clear. And that quote, by the way, that I just said is a paraphrase from uh, Clay Christensen, who wrote a book called yeah. The Innovator's Dilemma. And um, this is something that we see from time to time, which is like, the, the future of AI and Web3 and blockchain is going to be a lot stranger than what we can imagine based on what we know, because it's going to be the future. It's going to be different. Um, but in terms of, of how these technologies come together, you know, I think that in financial services, um, the industry is going to be virtually unrecognizable um, in a decade or so. And a lot of that has to do with the uh, impact of technologies like blockchain and AI. I mean, an a there's no reason why, you know, an AI bot that, um, you know, you start with as a young person gets to know you because 
becomes your friend, uh, understands everything about you from your health records to, you know, your personality traits, to your risk tolerance, to your income levels, to everything else, couldn't be a better financial advisor than most financial advisors, right? That's uh, that's a, a, a technology that will know you on a much more deep and intimate level with more information than any person could possibly hope to imagine with you filling out a form and getting to know you over a phone call. So I wonder, um, you know, and th there's an issue there, which is that, you know, um, AI bots, I don't think can get registered as, um, you know, investment advisors in the United States yet. But that's a regulatory question, not a technology question. So I think about how AI could impact, you know, the, the human side of financial services. A lot of um, uh, trading and settlement of securities is already, you know, automated. A lot of yep. uh, fund management is already automated through index funds or, you know, algorithmic trading and so forth. But the advisory part of it um, is still where most assets exist in places like the United States and Canada. Where I live, 60% of all the wealth is controlled through the advisor channel. But what, what happens to the advisor channel when, when AI can do it just much better and have a more, not, not just like cheaper cost or less costly and so forth, but actually have more, more human experience with technology than with a person. So that's something I think about. And then with blockchains, um, you know, the question is basically, all these assets in the world, trillions and trillions of dollars, still basically exist on analog rails, you know, pretty much. Right. And we right. could be using tokens as a way to um, completely automate the movement and storage of value in the economy. And you pointed out it's not about currency, it's about value. The way that I think about tokens is basically as containers for value. And I think this is helpful to understand because people get wrapped up in the whole crypto part of it. And they think, well, you know, there's all these cryptocurrencies. Why do we need thousands of currencies? You know, doesn't that seem to add friction, not take it away? And the issue is that people think of them as currencies when they're not. So tokens... And there are lots of different types of tokens, but the easiest way to think about it is as a container for value. And just as a con shipping container, think of a literal shipping container, can contain, you know, my book <laughs> or contain furniture or, you know, canned goods or computer chips or whatever, uh, a container, a digital container can contain anything um, of value. So stocks, bonds, titles, deeds, votes, art, collectibles, money, um, you know, uh, 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 certificates of deposit, like receipts for, uh, you know, gold and commodities held somewhere. So all those different things that you, th that you can think of can be contained in a token. Um, and I think an, a good useful analogy for people who are more tech inclined is that a website is basically like a container for information. You know, it's like a, a thing, it's a tabula rasa. It can be anything. It can be a podcast studio, which is what this is. It can be a social media site. It can be the news. It can be whatever. Right. And, um, I think like once you realize that there's an infinite configuration of websites, there's an infinite configuration of tokens. And so every single asset in the economy, in my opinion, will be tokenized at some point and will trade on blockchains. And that's going to make it. And why is that a good thing? Well, it will reduce the cost of settlement and uh, the time of settlement to, to near zero. It will it will connect to the world in ways that we haven't ever experienced. Um, you know, they say technology is a steamroller or sorry, technology is a, I just bear, you know, I gave you the punchline. If they say <laughs> technology flattens the world, then I think that Web3 and tokens will be a steamroller in the sense that they will connect people, not just with information, but with value and with assets. And um, that's something that I think, you know, a lot of people haven't really uh, fully understood. And the other thing is they'll bring people into the economy that don't currently have access to financial services, whether it's um, you know, people who are underbanked or unbanked or young people who are more used to using new technology. So all of these things are all happening all at once. And I think that, you know, we haven't really prepared for what that that transformation looks like. So so it's interesting when you look at Web3, you're really looking at the confluence of data insights, the ability to process that data insights and technology to be able to hold it all because it's really exploded well beyond a traditional, as you mentioned, really a traditional cloud technology. But at the end of the day, someone's going to own all that insight and, and no one's going to let it go if they don't trust yeah. and believe in the technology that's underneath it. So we get to the whole concept of identity and trust because, yeah. you know, this only works, all this only works if the consumer and the business say, I want to play. And, and right now, tech, the, the foundation of security and the foundation of uh, compliance and Fed regulations really haven't caught up to what's going to be possible. But at some point, they're going to catch up and say, you know, consumers going to have complete control. And so just like it is today, 
the power of Web 3.0, from my perspective, is all going to be dependent on people trusting the technology and billing, being willing to share their identity at their discretion out in the marketplace. And it's going to, again, be a transfer of value. In other words, I'll only do it like I, I keep on referring to Amazon. I only do it with Amazon because they do really well with my data and I get a lot of value in return. In fact, we pay for the right to shop, which is insane. How are we going to do the whole securitization of identity, of information? How are we going to make John Q. Public comfortable in this environment? It's a great question. So number one, I think that the question of identity hits at the heart of this. So in a Web2 model, you create all this data, but you don't actually own it. It's owned by the platforms you're interacting with, you know, whether it's you know, Amazon or Facebook or what have you. And you get access to services in exchange. They monetize your information. Now, that was a bargain that we entered into without really, I think, really appreciating what, what it meant <laughs> um, in the early days. And now I think it increasingly feels like a bad deal for a lot of folks. And I think that they would like to, all things being equal, have more control over their identity. And if their data and their digital creations and content is being used to make money, maybe they'd like to participate in that. So the Web3 model for identity is a user-centric model. The idea is that you, know, you as an internet user have a wallet and your wallet allows you to contain things of value. Now, people think mostly of like money and crypto and stuff like that. But uh, just as your current wallet can contain your identity, you know, your driver's license, um, other things that have access to value, credit cards, bank cards, and so forth, your, your wallet online can do the same thing. And that can be how you control how you interact with the internet. And if, you know, you're, someone wants to use your data, to your point, you know, we did, can decide how it's used and whether it gets monetized and as a result, if we get paid for it. And I think that that's an important um, innovation. But none of this will work unless the underlying technology is provable, right? And right now we know that, um, you know, big blockchain networks and AI technologies, large language models are exciting. And they're also, um, you know, robust, much more than they used to be. But they have lots of problems, right? You know, a large language model, people are treating as if it's a research assistant, when the reality is it doesn't really know anything. It doesn't always know what's right from what's wrong. And I don't mean that like in a moral sense. Right, I mean right. that what is correct and what is just fabricated, <laughs> you know, and so it's- And it's when not, in doubt, they sometimes, the, the model actually fabricates itself. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's kind of like a person, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, when, 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 boxed into a, a corner and trying to come up with an answer, you might like kind of try and talk your way out of it. And I think that these these models try to talk their way out of it, even though they don't know. It'd be better if they just said, I don't know. But they don't, they don't know that they don't know because they're just predictive right. <laughs> algorithms. Right. Right. Um, and the same is true with blockchains in a sense, which is, and and like I mentioned the idea of like the, the financial advisor, you certainly want your financial advisor making prudent decisions on your behalf, right? Not that, not that human advisors always do that, but in the case of large language models, they need to be better than the people in order for us to be able to accept them. And then when it comes to blockchains, you know, the question is, well, are these networks secure? Can they be scaled? Will the costs always remain reasonable? Um, Will uh, my identity and data, if I do control it, is that safe with me? And how do I ensure that it remains protected? And all of these questions exist around new technologies. You know, it's even like uh, self-driving cars. Self-driving cars can't be as good as people. They need to be 100 times better than people in order for us to accept them. Because it's the second a self-driving car runs, runs somebody over. We're already seeing it. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that becomes like the big, big kind of issue. So um, my point is only, are these all you know, valid uh, issues, um, reasons that that these new technologies are not worth the time, or are they implementation challenges to be overcome? And I think in each instance, they're an implementation challenge to be overcome. You know, in the case of AI, we can create, um, you know, experiences for users and solutions in the economy and, you know, new forms of entertainment and, um, and companionship and um, value that, that wasn't possible before. And with blockchains, we can, you know, flatten the world and give everybody access, not just to ways, ways to consume in, information and content, but ways to move value, store value, access financial services, uh, secure their identities, and build wealth on a globally level playing field. That's not possible. You know, with robotics and self-driving cars and these other technologies, 
you know, we have a way to potentially scale it to, to a point where we're reducing traffic accidents, where we're reducing the carbon footprint materially because people don't need to own cars, where we're giving a, a ride to, you know, individuals um, who can't be discriminated upon based on, you know, race and gender and so on and so forth. So like all those new, all these re- are reasons that that these new technologies are worth the time, they're worth expo- they're worth trying to overcome the tough questions because the opportunity is to make a, an economy in a world that is, you know, more more fair, more efficient, more innovative, more robust. And, and I think we should all be working towards that. You know, your your analogy to the self-driving cars is important because it, we won't accept Web3 and the components of Web3 if it simply duplicates where we are today, but maybe faster. It's going to have to be much, much better. And, and we've seen that. So we, we touched upon a lot of foundational issues, Alex, but how will Web3 impact traditional banking activities such as payments, lending, wealth management? You always touched upon some of that, and, and I think a lot yeah. of it has been in the wealth management space and as it relates to blockchain, but what else do you see on the horizon? Well, it's a great question. I think when a lot of people talk about innovation and financial services, this term fintech comes up from, from time to time, and I'm sure it has on your show as well. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, fintech obviously is an important um, thing, <laughs> you know, and fintech's been around for a while. I think the first credit card uh, was really sort of, you know, an example of early fintech innovation, right? It sort of um, dis- disintermediate, uh, you know, disassociated the, the cash from the from the purchase and, and created like a virtual form of money. Um, and I think ever since then, we've seen tons of innovations, you know, uh, prepaid debit cards, uh, buy now, pay later, um, you know, uh, ETFs discount brokerages, zero fee mutual funds, like all these kinds of things. In a way, these are all versions of financial innovation and financial technology. And, uh, you know, more recently, we've seen, you know, payments processors um, and other uh, forms of of, um, fintech innovation. But fundamentally, all of this fintech innovation, um, in my view, is really just digital wallpaper. It is a fresh coat of paint. It is a new interface to access the existing world of financial services. So, you know, when you interact with, uh, you know, PayPal or you tap your card on the card reader or you buy security in a discount brokerage, you know, it's, hap- you know, on Robinhood or something, and it feels all very digital and intuitive, it may feel like that because the interface is uh, been digitized, right? The way in which you interact with it is um, quite innovative. But on the back end, all of the companies and, and institutions and technologies that you're interacting with are legacy technologies, right? Um, you know, the technologies for uh, clearing and settling, settling transactions and securities in some cases run on technology that's decades old. So if you think about the analogy of a house, this fresh coat of wallpaper, this fresh coat of paint um, is concealing infrastructure, you know, plumbing, electrical, and so forth, that is a little bit tired and can use some work. Yeah. So what Web3 promises is not a new coat of paint, but a new foundation for the industry. Web3 tries to uh, get to the heart of what the industry actually does and create sort of models for people to do it peer to peer. So what is it that the industry actually does, right? Well, the financial industry is, you know, more than any one industry. It's the lifeblood of commerce. Its, its leaders are known as the masters of the universe, or at least they were in the 80s. Um, but, uh, but fundamentally, it does a few things. It gives us a way to move value, to store value, to access credit, to uh, insure against risk, to uh, create ways for people to invest money, to create venues for individuals and businesses to transact and trade in financial assets, the exchange function, to organize financial information, and to establish identity. And those eight or nine functions are basically, you know, the foundation of our entire economic order, right? You know, even something like identity, KYC and AML, that is the starting point for financial services. Um, How we move and store value, that is the the foundation of, of, uh, you know, most banks. You know, the the CEO of one of Canada's biggest banks once told me, we uh, move money. And because we move money, we get to store money. And because we store money, we get to lend money. And lending is basically most of our business. So if you move the moving part, if that part gets disrupted, then all of a sudden the foundation of our business is kind of on shaky ground, right? And the same is true in all other parts of the economy. And so where is the innovation happening right now? Well, for example, in in moving money, 
one of the fastest growing and most important innovations um, in the space today is a thing called a stable coin. Now, your listeners may or may not have heard of this, but they're worth around $120 billion in value. And basically, they are tokenized dollars. They're a way to move U.S. dollars around the world, peer-to-peer, instantaneously between individuals and businesses in increments both small and humongous, you know, up to hundreds of millions of dollars. And to do that in a way that doesn't require an intermediary. Now, every person in the world wants a U.S. dollar bank account. I'm not sure where all your where all your listeners are, Jim, right. you know, in the US, people might say, well, I can already do that with Venmo. It's like, well, you can do that in small increments between individuals in the United States using the same application. And that's all true. But if you want to have a standard that individuals can use all around the world in any amount um, that they want, then there's only really one way to do that. And that's with Web3. So it's with blockchain based tokens. So stable coins, are one of the fastest growing areas. But they're also just the very first example of a so-called real world asset being put into the token container. But there's all these other examples, you know, money market funds, mutual funds, um, you know, deposits, all forms of assets can be put into this container so that they can become global and become and become digital. You know, in the in the in the 1970s and 80s, people used to, you know, read newspapers. And if you lived in LA and you wanted the Boston Globe, like tough luck. There was no Boston Globe for sale in, in Los Angeles. Um, but then the internet democratized access to information. So Web3 democratizes access to financial services. Yep. It creates a digital global platform for us to access, for anyone anywhere to access everything that people can access in local markets. And I think that's very important. So that's just moving value. And then there's eight other examples of, of how it's being used in practice. So everything we, we talk about makes all this sense but it's not being accepted by everybody. You, we, we mentioned early blockchain and, and that was blockchain and even cloud technology was something that people said, you know, it was usually around security, the issues of security. But what do you see right now as the main challenges around mainstream adoption of Web3 technology and adaptation of all the elements of Web3? in banking and financial services? Is it risk? Is it um, legacy thinking? Is it a combination? What is it? I think it's all of the above. I mean, ultimately, you know, if you build it, um, they will come. I mean, if something is is so compelling and, and interesting and new, then it's going to find a product market fit. And that's true of Web3. You know, it depends on how you measure penetration on this. So if the, if the measure of, you know, Web3 is how many people are using tokens and large language models and the rest, you know, it's maybe a couple hundred, maybe a few hundred million people. Um, if the if the measure is how many people are like deep in the weeds and like, you know, holding their own ass, digital assets and using these wallets that I was describing, the number is a little smaller than that. It's more like, you know, 30 million people. Right. So either way you look at it, we're still in the sort of early adopter phase for a lot of this technology. Um, and I do think that we're going to be hitting a, uh, a inflection point at some point very soon. Um, and so I think if you build these solutions and things that people find really helpful and fun and innovative and useful, then they will start to use them. Um, I think that one of the things that that I find really interesting is that in the, in the very early days of a new technology, the new technology isn't isn't better. I think a lot of people assume the new tech, the new new thing comes along, and it's just so much better. You know, in the early 1990s, the experience of reading a newspaper was actually a lot better than trying to find the news on the internet. Right? It was actually much worse. Um, in the 1980s, when a lot of like companies went to PCs from mini computers, those computers were actually not as powerful and not as useful for you know rote data processing as mini computers and, and uh, mainframes were previously. Right? Um, even like watching content on the internet. You know, there's this great. <laughs> clip of Bill Gates on David Letterman, where he's talking about things you can do with the internet. And Bill Gates says, well, you know, you can listen to the radio on the internet. (laughs) It's like, you can listen to the radio on the radio. Like, what are you talking about? Um, So, but what, what happens with new technologies is that they often find product market fit with a small um, segment of the market that for whom the the things that maybe might be perceived as weaknesses are actually strengths. So this is something that that um, that you know uh, academics have talked about before in the past. You know the the first Japanese motorcycles arrived in the United States and and people used to driving Harleys thought they were just ridiculous little toys, but actually they found product market fit with people who like to go off roading and all of a sudden that helped to unlock a huge market. And uh, it, with Web three, you know one of the big benefits is that 
you can custody your own assets. You can you can be your own bank. You can control your own identity online. And for some people, that actually sounds like a big inconvenience. They would rather leave their money and their assets with the bank than to have it themselves. But for lots of other individuals, you know, young people who are used to buying virtual goods and, and video games, or people who are unbanked, or those living in countries where the local systems are are corrupt, being able to custody your own digital goods is actually like a superpower. And so the question is, will will the small segment of the market that enjoys those benefits um, continue to uh, sustain it so that it becomes the market, right? So that it ends up becoming more robust, more useful for everybody else. And then that becomes user behavior that everybody adopts. You know, they used to say that there would never be more than a million vehicles on the road because there were only that many uh, sh trained chauffeurs in the entire world or something like that, right? right. It's like, well, it, it, we couldn't process the idea that people would drive their own cars, right? You know, managers would never learn how to use computers because they didn't know how to type because typing was something that secretaries did. So we couldn't com com imagine that computers could be tools for communication that individuals and in business management you know, professionals would use. The same, I feel, is true for a lot of these technology tools too. So we have to be kind of humble in the face of innovation um, because, you know, uh, as as Christensen said, you know, not only is the market unknown, it's unknowable. These things ha are going to happen and uh, we'll just have to do our best to, to um, prepare for them. Yeah, change sucks. I mean, I, I say this almost in every podcast now that, you know, nobody really likes change. Change sucks. But it's, but it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen with or without me. And and again, it's going to be interesting to see if it's going to be governmental units, if it's going to be financial institutions or who's going to own or who's going to allow and deploy identity, make it so it's uniform. You know, we 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 keep on going back and forth as far as how's that all going to happen, but it really gets down to authentication more than identity. You know, where you, how do you authenticate what you're doing on a daily basis? So what advice would you give bank and financial institutions around navigating this whole technology shift right now? Well, you, you raise a great point. And, you know, there's a famous Canadian, um, uh, thought leader. His name's um, Marshall McLuhan. And, yeah. you know, Marshall, Marshall McLuhan once said that he also hates change, which is funny because he was someone who was like very ahead of the ahead of the game and trying to predict change. And he said, well, I'm not just going to let the zeitgeist bowl me over. I'm going to try and prepare for it. Right. You know, even if I hate it, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be prepared for it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that maybe that's a useful framework for, you know, bankers and other financial professionals who, you know, um, this, for whom the status quo might be comfortable, uh, but and change might be scary. Well, the good news is that there are things that you can do. So the first thing you can do is become educated. Um, I would recommend that everybody go out and buy my there new book. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, I was going to say the same thing that you're fearful of things you don't know, which doesn't say to, to stay in a hole and hope it doesn't happen. But now more than ever, because the deployment of insight is so easy right now. If you yeah. want to, if you want to, you know, as I did, if you want to take this book and consolidate and say, okay, what does it talk about? Is it for me? You can use the internet to do that today. And it's only been out for a week, a little bit more than a week. So, you know, it's important to do that. But you're right. It's education in both the traditional way and in non-traditional ways. Sometimes dipping yeah. your foot in the water. Well, that's right. And that's number two which is personal use. You know, if you haven't used a large, if you haven't used ChatGPT or you haven't, you know, um, bought or sold a digital asset, like you should go do that right now. Yeah. Um, you know, you should, if you haven't donned an, an extended reality headset just to get a feel for like what it is and maybe it isn't ready for prime time, but you know, you can't, you can read a 300 page book about um, Web3 and I encourage you to do so, yeah. <laughs> but you should also, um, pers you know, engage in personal use. Personal use is a precondition for understanding. And I think that's really important. Number three is that, you know, I think that in 2016, 17, it was tough for enterprise leaders to um, navigate change because the promise of blockchain was so great, but the the path to get there was unknown, right? And now I think there's a much more robust toolkit that you can tap into to try and learn about the stuff and use it and put it into practice. So, you know, I would say start now, start small, be able to change quickly um, and just keep innovating. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a frontier. I mean, I, I, the name of my book is Web3, charting the internet's next economic and cultural frontier. And with all new technologies, it's a bit of a frontier. And look, frontiers have boundless opportunity and economic potential, but they also have lots of risks and they also have lots of pitfalls. And they attract the most shrewd business people and the most you know, fervent believers. 
and missionaries, but they also attract the wrong kinds of folks too. So, um, you know, every frontiers person needs a guide. Every explorer needs a guide. And, and with, with some humility, I hope that mine, mine proves useful. Well, it, it's going to be there. The, the good news, as I said early in our podcast, is that most of the technology now is becoming user-centric, whereby it's really focused on making life better. In addition, as we saw with blockchain and with cloud technology, if you have concerns about things not being right, such as security, things like this, the marketplace will answer that question. We've done it on both the cloud and we've done it on blockchain, whereby now financial institutions re rely on both extensively. But it wasn't but five years ago that people said, I'm not going to put anything on the cloud. It's outside technology. And then realized it was more secure than their internal mainframes. I, th I think there's a lot to happen in, and I just urge everybody, as I do many times in the podcast and other things I write about and, and do webinars on is you, don't put your head in the sand, you know, be, become familiar with the change because it's going to be here before you expect it. I guarantee it. It always is. And it's becoming more and more the case. And yes, if you say, oh, those Google goggles, you know, goggles are not going to work for me. It may not work for you. But how about contact lenses? Or how about something embedded in your, in your skin or in your body? Those things may sound way out there, but some version of that is gonna take effect. So, you know, we've, we've gotta get out of our comfort zone a little bit, at least become familiar for no other reason to protect ourselves. So Alex, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I, I really appreciate it. It's good to see you again. And hopefully we'll be uh, speaking together again very soon. Yeah, well, thanks, that was terrific. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking and the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. We appreciate the support we have received to make this endeavor a success. If you enjoy what we're doing, please take some time to show some love in the form of a review. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and the research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcasts. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Haslidge, audio engineer, Chris Vifalius, and video producer, Will Pritz. If you have not already done so, remember to subscribe to the Banking Transform podcast on both your favorite podcast app and on our new YouTube channel for more thought-provoking discussions on the intersection of finance, technology, and leadership. Thank you again for joining us. And until next time, keep innovating and transforming. Thank <music> you.